before I get on to Sri Lanka, um, of course, there was a lot of Asia I didn't have time to cover yesterday and which we didn't talk about. We didn't really talk about Japan or, or India, 1.3 billion people, um, or Indonesia, which is the biggest Muslim nation on earth, population close to 200 million. So if any of you, before we start on Sri Lanka, if any of you have questions or thoughts on other parts of Asia we didn't really cover, but you're really interested in talking a little bit about, then now is the time. Uh, so any, uh, any, any, uh, any takers? Yes. I just have a question about South Southeast Asia. Yes. And like it's uh, it's in uh, it's like industrialization uh, policies. Yeah. I mean I I've read in press mainly that Southeast Asia is like becoming more and more concurrential to to China and Japan. Yeah. And South Africa is it true or is it just like a catch, a catch line a catchphrase? Uh, no, it's very important. Um, often overlooked. Um, Southeast Asia is basically ten countries. Um, I mean, I don't, I would call up the map I used yesterday. Uh, and uh, there's an old Chinese uh, word for those countries, it's Nanyang. Nanyang means the lands in between. In other words, the lands in between China and India. The, so Southeast Asia is that middle of the sandwich with China and India as the, the outer two layers. Uh, 650 million people in those 10 countries of which Indonesia accounts for almost one-third, Singapore only 5.7 million. Um, so you have several countries with substantial populations. Uh, they're very different from each other, those countries, culturally, historically, ethnically, religiously. Um, uh, but they do have a common trading area uh, and a common organization. It's called ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. It's a fairly loose arrangement, so it's not like the EU. It's not that institutionally strong. It's an intergovernmental organization, effectively. But it does have a common trading area, so they have practically zero tariffs among each other. Um, their political leaders and their officials meet all the time. Um, they may not get much done, but um, operating on the presumption that jaw jaw is better than war war, and there have been violent conflicts in the region before, that's a good thing in itself. The main reason why Southeast Asia is economically and commercially important is because it's one of the world's hubs for global supply chains. So you have multinationals from the United States, from Europe, from Japan and increasingly from other countries like China and India who have substantial operations usually with regional headquarters in Singapore so that's one of Singapore's global city functions being a headquarters being a, a hub for headquarters operations of multinationals but with production sites particularly in areas like electronics and telecom equipment and so on in Malaysia, Thailand for cars. Thailand, Thailand is the Detroit of Asia for cars and trucks. Um, Vietnam is the hottest new kid on the block in Southeast Asia, which attracting hundreds of billions of dollars of investment, particularly in, in electronics uh, from American, Japanese, Korean, and other multinationals. So you, you, you have these some Southeast Asian countries which are very much part of these global supply chains that, of course, link them to China, to Japan, to South Korea, to Taiwan, uh, on the services side, increasingly to India, uh, and, of course, to, to global markets uh, uh, in the West. So the West still accounts for more than 50% of their final markets. Right? So that's the importance of Southeast Asia economically, and that's only going to grow it's not going to stagnate or decline for several reasons. One of the reasons being, I mean, proximity to India and China is key, but also some of these countries are still relatively poor, like Vietnam, like Indonesia, like the Philippines. 
which means they also have big growth potential. So, you know, the, the, you're talking about countries with growth, growth potential in that region of, say, 5 to 8 percent, you know, as opposed to 0 to 4 percent. That makes them very important. So, to sum up, they're, they're important geopolitically and they're important economically, and the two are very much related. Um, perhaps a final, final question, if anyone's interested in any of the other countries in the region. Otherwise, I will move on swiftly to Sri Lanka. Um, right. Um, now, the reason why I'm talking about Sri Lanka today is, uh, I mean, it's subjective. I am Sri Lankan, so obviously Sri Lanka is the most important interesting country in the world to me. Um, uh, but uh, uh, I think the, the main purpose of what I'm going to talk about today and our discussion is really to draw some lessons on what went wrong in Sri Lanka and what it means for the rest of the world and where ideas of economic freedom and opposing them ideas of economic collectivism uh, fit in. Um, and first I'll, I'll say a little bit more about my own Sri Lankan connection. Um, I don't look particularly Sri Lankan. <laughs> That's because the other half of me is British. Um, my accent is not a typical Sri Lankan accent. Um, gets a little bit more Sri Lankan when I'm in Sri Lanka. It becomes somewhat more sing-song and I use my hands a little bit more. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that and then talk about uh, uh, the features of the current crisis, the explanations behind it, uh, and what the global lessons from the Sri Lankan crisis are, in, uh, in, in, in my view. So let, 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 me, let me start with my own connection. I told you yesterday that I am half Sri Lankan. Um, I was actually born and uh, brought up there. Um, and uh, for about three decades, I didn't go to Sri Lanka much. I was mainly in the UK. But I started going back in my early 40s, about 15 years ago. Um, and uh, that was one reason for me to move to Singapore, so I could go to Sri Lanka several times a year. It's a three-and-a-half-hour flight from, from Singapore. Um, and I spent over 10 years traveling the length and the breadth of Sri Lanka, I got to know it much better than I did as a child because I was writing a book. Uh, so I, I, I spent the best part of a decade, decade traveling and writing uh, what came to be a, a travel memoir. So it's not a policy book. It's not an academic book. Uh, I made a sort of transition from sort of academic and policy wonk writing to something completely different. Um, uh, but it... it it really got me to know the country a lot better uh, over the course of that decade. Uh, now, I know Israelis, after they finish the army, some of them go to Sri Lanka for surfing. In fact, I met... Uh, <laughs> remind me of your name? Shahar. Shahar uh, did that. Um, so, for, uh, I'm not going to talk about my book uh, in this lecture. Uh, but uh, for those of you who might be thinking of going to Sri Lanka after you finish the army <laughs> or at some stage and want to do something more than surfing and uh, get to know the country a little better, you might think of taking a look at my book uh, because it does talk a lot about the, the history, the politics, uh, the economy, the cultures, the religions, and, and so on. Um, just a few very quick slides. Uh, uh, I think the book has a rather nice cover. Uh, that gives you a sense of the island. So it's, it's teardrop shaped just off the coast of uh, South India. Uh, it's not that big. Um, north to south is uh, about 250 miles, whatever that is in kilometers. Uh, and it's about 150 miles east to west. Uh, I, uh, 65 thousand square kilometers, I think it is. I'm not sure if that's smaller or bigger than Israel. Um, uh, there's little me 50 years ago with my extended family. As you see, a, a lot of different, uh, well, it's a black and white photo, but you get a sense of the different colors. 
Uh, that's me 30 years ago with my father and siblings and my grandmother. And that's me on the road, having not a tea break, but that's a coconut water break, somewhere, I think, on the, in the eastern province of Sri Lanka with my driver. Um, anyway, enough of all that. Um, one other point to mention, uh, which I haven't done so far. Um, I spent three years as a policy advisor to a previous government, uh, to the Prime Minister and the Minister of Finance. So I saw policy making in, Singapore, in Sri Lanka in all its mess and chaos at quite close quarters. And the, the Prime Minister I then advised is now the President of the country. And I no longer advise him uh, for good or ill. Um, so uh, I, uh, that's the closest I've ever got to actual policy making at a high level in a developing country. Um, so I'll have some observations based, uh, based on that. A basic fact sheet of Sri Lanka. Um, it's about an $85 billion economy. Um, uh, which uh, is pretty modest. Uh, for a population of 22 million now. Land area, as I said, of about, about 65,000 square kilometers. Uh, the rest you don't need to worry about because that will come up a little bit later. Um, again, some basic facts about Sri Lanka. Uh, it's a multi-ethnic country. Um, the majority population are ethnically Sinhalese um, with ancestry from mainly North India. And most of them are Buddhists. So Sri Lanka is one of the major Buddhists, Buddhist countries in the world. Two-thirds of the population are Buddhists. Um, many would consider it to be the cradle of what is called Theravada Buddhism, which is the early Buddhist tradition. Uh, Mahayana is more the, the, the Chinese, Japanese uh, Buddhist tradition that came a little bit later. Um, about... Uh, 15 to 20 percent of the population are ethnically Tamils, mainly from South India, their ancestry, uh, and they're mainly Hindus, which of course is the main religion of India. But there's also a minority of Christians, uh, 9 percent of the population, thereabouts, mainly Roman Catholics. Uh, that's a product of Western colonization. So another important historical feature, Sri Lanka, probably more than any other country in Asia, has been influenced by the West because of 450 years of Western co colonization. 150 years of Portugal, hence Roman Catholicism, 150 years of the Dutch, uh, and 150 years of the British until independence in 1948, six months after India got independence, India and Pakistan. Um, and then almost 10% of the population are Muslims, and I come from that community. The Muslims historically have been the traders in Sri Lanka, knitting the country together through trade, even before the Portuguese, the Dutch, and the British arrived. So, uh, so much for basic uh, facts and figures. Now, um, and, well, I do have that map, yes. Uh, now, I'm showing you that map really for one, for one reason, for one simple reason. Just look at the location of Sri Lanka. It should give you an immediate idea of its economic potential. Potential largely unrealized in modern times for all sorts of reasons. But if you just look at that, um, it's almost exactly halfway between Dubai and Singapore. Right. And there is no world-class port between Dubai and Singapore, across that vast stretch of the Indian Ocean. There are, of course, ports in India, but they're very badly run in all sorts of ways. One of the big potentials for Sri Lanka is for the port of Colombo to become that world-class port exactly halfway between Dubai and Singapore. You can imagine the, the amount of shipping that goes both ways between those two, between Jebel Ali in Dubai and the port of Singapore. Uh, so a big bulk of world trade that goes by sea goes along those routes and stops at those two ports. 
and there is uh, there are compelling economic reasons for a port in between, given the distance between the two. Right? So that gives you one indication of Sri Lanka's potential. And historically, you know, Sri Lanka has been a stopping point on trading routes uh, across the Indian Ocean, uh, connecting the Gulf uh, all the way to the Chinese coastline, you know, going through Southeast Asia in, in between. Um, uh, do stop me along the way, by the way, if you have any, any, any questions or any, any points you, you wish to raise. Um, okay. Now, uh, one slide is missing before I come to features of the current crisis. Um, it's uh, in December 2016, I gave a lecture in Colombo uh, to a, a think tank I helped to found called Advocata, which is Sri Lanka's free market think tank. Um, um, and what I did then was paint three scenarios of Sri Lanka's future. And I updated it in my, in my book, which came out in uh, uh, about three and a half years ago. So this is pre-COVID. And what I did was I, I painted three scenarios of Sri Lanka's future. And I'll go through those scen three scenarios, uh, because one scenario, I think, has actually come to pass. And that'll give you an idea of the Sri Lankan present. So the first scenario that I... I uh, outlined was of drift, which was roughly a continuation of where Sri Lanka was, as I thought it was, a few years ago. That was the time when I was an advisor to, to, to the government. So what was that, that drift scenario was of basically dysfunctional government, a government talking about reforms but not doing serious structural reforms, of a fairly low growth rate, around 3%. Low for a country at Sri Lanka stage of development, where the potential is probably double that. Um, bad relations among the ethnic and religious groups. Sri Lanka has had those problems. It had a civil war for 25 years because of its ethnic and religious problems. Um, uh, bad climate for doing business. And the bottom line, the elite doing well, um, but most of the people remaining undereducated, underskilled, underemployed, with all sorts of life chances being missed, and symptoms of that. Sri Lankans send a lot of migrant workers to the Middle East. You know, those of you from in, in Bahrain and the UAE will be used to lots of Sri Lankan migrant workers, including uh, maids in, in houses and waiters and cooks in hotels and restaurants and so on. Um, now, that's, that's good, uh, especially poor people and workers who have not had a good schooling, who don't have highfalutin professional qualifications to go and get jobs elsewhere where they are better paid and they can send money back, build houses, set up businesses for their families. The problem is that they're doing that, of course, because of lack of opportunities in Sri Lanka. And I mean, I, I, I know several stories, including the term for it is Aya, the maid I had when I was a child, who spent 10 years slaving away in Saudi and uh, Kuwait, I think it was, whose daughter is now spending 10 years in Kuwait. In other words, not seeing their children grow up because of poverty at home. So that continues. Just as you have, if you go to Sri Lanka, you'll see it's actually almost a million three-wheelers, these three-wheel three scooters. And you see these drivers just lounging. Again, better than nothing. But they're underworked, they're underemployed, they're underpaid because of lack of productive opportunity, jobs, uh, and jobs with upward mobility uh, in Sri Lanka itself. So that drift scenario is very much about that continuing into the indefinite future from one generation to the next, where life chances essentially are not grasped and are being missed. The second scenario I had was much more optimistic. It was of Sri Lanka taking off to realize the kind of potential that I showed you when I showed you that last map, of a Sri Lanka driven much more by the, a productive private sector, 
with much higher levels of imports and exports, with much higher levels of foreign investment, not coming just from Chinese state-owned companies, but from Indian companies and Western companies with productive private sector investment, of a Sri Lanka that would be integrated into the global supply chains I talked about with respect to Southeast Asia. India is 20 miles away. The most obvious thing is for Sri Lanka to link up with Indian supply chains in manufacturing and services, with hu services hubs like Bangalore and Hyderabad, with manufacturing hubs like uh, Madras, Chennai, which is the capital of Tamil Nadu. It's a 45-minute flight away. Uh, and then link up with Southeast Asian supply chains, get companies like Samsung and Motorola and Apple and others to come in, have a BPO hub, and so on and so forth. We actually have a lot of really very promising IT graduates coming out of Sri Lankan uh, institutes and universities. But there's a barrier. Uh, they don't get productive jobs. Often they emigrate to places like Canada and Australia rather than stay in Sri Lanka. So we're missing out on all of that. So the, the optimistic scenario is of that happening, private sector driven, foreign investment driven, global supply chains, a Colombo port that would be the hub between Dubai and Singapore. Uh, and if that were to happen, then the growth rate would go up to around that 5 to 6% mark, enough to raise living standards per capita and drag lots of people out of poverty into the lower middle class uh, and reverse the kind of situation I mentioned with the previous scenario. But of course, none of that would happen automatically. It would require some really significant policy reforms uh, to unleash those animal spirits in the private sector. To The domestic business climate is incredibly complicated. My father was in the hotel business. Uh, I know from friends who run hotels in Sri Lanka and from foreigners who've been interested in setting up hotels in Sri Lanka, you need to spend about two years getting something like 30 different licenses from 30 different ministries before you can even start construction. Right. Not to mention paying all kinds of people off under the table for all kinds of things. Getting land is incredibly difficult. Um, paying taxes. Firing someone can take you up to two years to go through labor tribunals, even if the case is obvious, even if someone has literally been sleeping on the job. Tariffs are high. The average tariff, once you include all the little extras, is close to 30%, uh, and so on and so forth. So big reforms are needed, so far not accomplished, uh, to realize that, uh, that takeoff scenario. And that takeoff scenario is also important for domestic peace, because with a higher growth, growth rate, it means, of course, the cake is bigger, which means that the different communities can share more you know, from genuine wealth creation, which would help with our domestic, religious, and ethnic problems. Those problems have got worse because the cake has not grown much, so you've had more quarreling over shares or slices of the cake, if you like. Uh, uh, and one of the big uh, sparks of uh, ethnic, ethno-religious hatred in Sri Lanka has been lack of economic opportunity. So Sinhalese Buddhists blame the minorities because it, the minorities are actually more productive and they get persecuted. Right? The minorities then sometimes resort to extremism. Uh, which is one of the causes of the, the conflict with the Tamil Tigers, which we had in Sri Lanka, which led to a civil war that lasted 25 years, and so on. But I did say with that scenario that it was unlikely to happen because of politics, because it, politically it was going to be very difficult to turn that situation around. My third scenario for Sri Lanka, I will just read out a paragraph from my book. And I was writing this, as I said, uh, about a year before COVID. So the few liberal gains since January 19, 2015 will be reversed. A big man will return to power. This could be a Rajapaksa, so Sri Lanka's ruling political dynasty until just a few months ago was the Rajapaksa family. Uh, 
So this could be a Rajapaksa or a combination of the family. He will promise to cleanse politics and institutions and in quotation marks get things done. So big men coming to power, that's always what they promise to do. He will co-opt opponents into his big tent. He will neuter remaining opponents and institutions he does not fully control, including the police, judiciary, armed forces and NGOs. He will centralize patronage politics and make it more comprehensive and systematic. There will be no rule of law. Sri Lanka will slide back to illiberal democracy, becoming again a tropical analog to Vladimir Putin's Russia. The economy will be state-led again. The public sector will expand, crowding out the productive parts of the private sector. Trade will shrink further and non-Chinese foreign investment will st stay away. The new big man will pander to the worst instincts of Singhala Buddhists, that's the majority of the population. He will spur extremist groups, targeting the minorities. Ethnic tensions will be kept on the boil. Muslims in particular will be at risk. They and other minorities will retreat further into their shelves. More than ever, Sri Lanka's ethnic communities will live in separate solitudes. Sri Lanka will distance itself again from India and the West and will become ever more dependent on Chinese projects and loans. The Chinese state and its proxies will buy up its political and business elites, and Sri Lanka will be a Chinese tributary state. So those were my three scenarios. And that's my segue to the state of Sri Lanka today. So to give you a political update, uh, in uh, November 2019, uh, Mr. Gota Baya Rajapaksa, uh, who is the brother of Sri Lanka's former president, Mahinda Rajapaksa, won the presidential election with a thumping majority. And the president is all powerful in Sri Lanka's constitution. So uh, he monopolized power. Then, in the following parliamentary election, his party, run by his family, won a close to a two-thirds majority. So he appointed his brother prime minister, his brother being the former president, as you see, all in the family. And there were three other brothers, plus a son, who were appointed to senior cabinet positions. So the family had four members of the cabinet controlling most of the budget, in addition to having the president, the head of state. They passed through an amendment to the constitution which removed checks and balances. It basically allowed them to appoint judges, senior policemen, uh, army commanders, and so on. Um, and so Sri Lanka once again became a one-family uh, operation. And that relapse scenario I portrayed, uh, as I thought would happen eventually, came to pass. So Sri Lanka again became an illiberal democracy with patronage politics, institutions degraded, effectively taken over by one family, an increase in corruption and nepotism, obviously. Um, and they brought back the ideas of economic collectivism. They ran the country with for a decade, between 2005 and 2015. So, and, and they also played the race card and the ethnic card because their vote bank is very much with the ethnic religious major majority, Sinhalese Buddhists, and so minorities were targeted. Uh, because of human rights violations during the Civil War, when they were in charge, uh, relations with the West were very bad, so they got worse again, and that plays up every so often in the UN Human Rights Council. Um, China, of course, doesn't ask unpleasant questions about human rights. Um, relations with India have long been quite testy. So China again became the best friend and Sri Lanka remained dependent on Chinese loans and projects as part of the Belt and Road Initiative I talked about uh, earlier. Um, so hence relapse. Um, so uh, now let me come to features of the current crisis. Uh, and I'm going to show you lots of slides, go through them quickly, but also give you, try and give you a flavor of what an economic crisis is really like. I mean, I spent two months traveling around Sri Lanka between April and June while this crisis was unraveling. Now, 
of course, you had a serious economic crisis in Israel going back to, was it the first half of the 1980s? So in your family histories, of course, you know what hyperinflation is like, what it's like for people to lose their jobs, what it's like to work for an unproductive state-owned company. You've not experienced that yourselves directly. You're too young for that, but it's certainly in the family memory, I would guess. No. Uh, in Sri Lanka, it's being, it's being played out live as we, as we speak. So let me give you a flavor of that before I come to come to the explanations behind it. So this crisis in Sri Lanka, which had been brewing for a long time and which was predicted by domestic as well as international experts, the government completely ignored that and was blind to reality, it exploded in March this year. Now, the trigger for it, it would have happened anyway, but probably accelerated by the Russia-Ukraine war, which of course sent the price of oil uh, skyrocketing right? and Sri Lanka has to import all its oil. In March the currency had to be devalued and if you look at this chart here in the space of a few weeks the currency lost almost half its value. The dollar rate went from something like 200 rupees to the dollar to 350 rupees to the dollar which is where it's at now. Now, for exporters, a good thing in the short term. So our garments exporters got a big boost because they had a better selling price abroad. But Sri Lanka has to import a lot. So its import prices skyrocketed, including the price of fuel. And what that brings in its wake, of course, is much more inflation. So that, among other things, that stoked inflation. Um, so a big devaluation. Uh, in March. Um, with that, and this is the chart on the, uh, on, I always get my lefts and my rights confused, on my right, uh, massive depletion of foreign exchange reserves. So partly because the central bank was trying to defend an artificial rate for the currency and wasting huge amounts of money, billions of dollars as a result, just lost, defending a rate that couldn't be defended and had to be devalued anyway, it got to the stage where there, were hardly any, there was hardly any foreign car currency, especially dollars, left in the central bank. The country literally ran out of dollars. Uh, and in May, Sri Lanka had to default on one or two repayments on foreign loans. So you had the first Asian default in 20 years, the first Sri Lankan default ever. Sri Lanka basically saying we can't afford to pay our foreign debts. And that of course means you can't borrow on international markets in the future. Uh, at least until there's a big debt restructuring and an IMF deal and so on. So, and an another point about this, uh, to bring it really down to a very concrete level, when you have hardly any dollars left in the central bank and in commercial banks, you can't pay for your shipments of oil and gas. So what happened from March, April? You had huge shortages of fuel. So when I was in Sri Lanka, there were petrol queues everywhere, snaking all over the country. Half the country seemed to be queuing for petrol, which sometimes wasn't there. I mean, a three-wheeler driver I talked to on my last day told me he had spent 11 hours the previous day just queuing for his tank of petrol, which would only last him one working day. In other words, he was losing one full working day, and we're talking about someone who's poor, right? not someone who can afford to spend a whole day in a queue and then drive an SUV around the country. So, and that, there's now a rationing system which makes things a little bit more efficient, but petrol is limited because of the lack of foreign exchange. Why didn't they uh, increase the, the interest rate? That's also happened. So, I mean, good for my savings in Sri Lanka. I can't take them out because of foreign exchange restrictions. But, uh, you know, I'm now getting an interest rate on... No, no, it's, it's gone from about 5% to 15%. Oh. So interest rates have skyrocketed. Uh, no other choice. The central bank had to do that. Yeah. But that doesn't solve the problem. There's still a shortage of foreign exchange. Uh, for one, you know... Uh, Tourists are not coming to Sri Lanka because of the current problems. 
That's a very important source of foreign exchange. Um, uh, tourism is minimal. When I was traveling around the country, there were some young backpackers around, but not regular tourists, for obvious reasons. Yeah, is Central Bank in Sri Lanka totally independent? Of no, that's another part of the problem. The Central Bank um, has gone through phases, but particularly under this ruling family, has been heavily politicized. And they've appointed their people to head the Central Bank. Um, and the central bank has been involved in some very questionable market operations. And under successive governments, particularly the Rajapaksa government, have been printing money like there's been no tomorrow. Right? So that stoked inflation. But it's also, of course, enabled the government to spend more without taxing, but uh, given them the incentive to borrow more. So the central bank has essentially been printing money to lend money to the government, which of course ne never gets paid back. Yeah. So you have all of those kinds of things going on. Cooking gas shortages, not enough foreign exchange to import kerosene, gas for cooking. So you have big queues for that as well. Electricity power cuts, there have been daily power cuts since February, right. uh, which affects the whole population. Um, but some parts of the population more than others because there are the more affluent parts of the population and that includes hotels and restaurants have their own generators. If you're well off enough, you can, you can have your own generator and therefore you know, cope with the power cuts, but not if you're poor or middle class. Um, so that gives you some sense of what a crisis is like in real life in real time. Um, Borrowing. Sri Lanka has become addicted to borrowing and foreign borrowing uh, very much like a heroin addict. So, um, and the foreign borrowing, particularly because Sri Lanka 10 to 15 years ago became a middle income country, is at market interest rates. It's not at concessional rates. So the borrowing costs have been increasing all the time. Uh, the government got to a stage where it had to borrow more abroad in order to service existing borrowings, to keep up with interest payments, as well as principal payments on existing borrowings. So you have a, a real vicious cycle in operation. It got to the stage where almost three quarters of government revenue had to be spent paying interest on domestic and especially foreign debt, which of course meant crowding out spending on infrastructure, on health care, on education, and other long-term things. Inflation. Again, I mean, this is very one of the central problems of the current crisis. Inflation in Sri Lanka is now running, as you see, at hyperinflationary levels, about 60%. Food inflation, around 90% at the moment. So what does that mean in, in practice? So, as I traveled around the country, I would keep coming across people, yeah, not just well-off people who can afford these prices, but poor and even middle-class people, say on fixed salaries, who complain that you know, the price of an egg is three times what it was in January. Uh, the price of tomatoes, the price of vegetables. There was someone I met in a hotel, a manager, who said that his family had actually stopped taking milk with their tea and stopped eating chicken because they couldn't afford it. This is a middle class person, a hotel manager, right, with education, who's worked in the Middle East. Um, he also told me, and I heard this from several others, that you know, poor people in, in his village had, re had been reduced to one meal a day. And parents were going without meals in order to feed their children. We, what the, the statistics show is that about 80% of the population have cut down on their food intake. About 25% of the population are in need of emergency food assistance. Right? I mean, I, I've been working with a charity in Sri Lanka for 15 years now, quite closely. And we had plans, you know, before COVID, of doing English language programs to upskill school leavers and university graduates so they could perform better in the job market. It's difficult to get a decent job in Sri Lanka if you don't have halfway decent English, and most of the population don't. But we've had to postpone these programs because of emergencies. Getting dry rations out 
to families who desperately need it, first during COVID and now during this crisis. Also bear in mind, about two-thirds of the workforce are in the informal economy. Right? Um, again, it's a product of economic collectivism and crowding out of the private sector because the disincentives are so large to not employing people legally, of course it means lots of people are employed illegally. They get cash in hand, often it's a daily wage, but there are no social protections, they don't pay taxes, uh, it means they can be laid off from today to tomorrow because there's no employment contract. And in a crisis, it means that from one day to the next, there's no money because you don't have work the following day. You don't have cash to feed your family. Probably don't have a bank account. You have no savings. So then what do you do? You're reliant on charity, right? which of course is a hit and miss, a very patchy affair. So this gives you some sense of what this crisis is like. Um, uh, and what it boils down to in terms of the overall headline numbers is GDP growth, which will probably shrink by up to 10% this year. Right. Um, and living standards. Well, pre-COVID, Sri Lanka had on average the highest living standard in South Asia next to the Maldives. The Maldives is exceptional because of its luxury tourism and has a tiny population. It's about 300 or 400,000. But average Sri Lankan living standards historically have been much higher than they have been in India, Pakistan and Bangladesh. So close to 4,000, just at the bottom end of upper middle income status, just before COVID. But as you see from that chart, quite a big decline as a result of first COVID and then, then this, uh, this crisis. Okay, so those are the features of the crisis. Uh, any, any questions you want to raise before I go on to explanations? Yes, I'll come to you in just a moment. Uh, yes, go ahead. Yeah. Aren't you afraid that uh, the big companies like, uh, I don't know, Samsung or any other big company that now abuses like India or China will, will abuse this authority uh, also in Sri Lanka? What do you mean by abuse? Um, Meaning like a really low salary. Okay. Yes. If we look at the record of multinational investment around the world, and I'm thinking particularly in Asia, I think it's overwhelmingly a positive record. So if, if you look at multinationals going to China, example, Apple, usually through Foxconn, which is a Chinese, which is a Taiwanese company, building big manufacturing plants, somewhere near Shanghai or Guangzhou or wherever. Um, or say, um, uh, it could be American Express having much of its back office operation in Hyderabad or Bangalore in India. No. Yes, it is true, compared with the salaries they pay to equivalently qualified workers in the US or Europe, it's much lower. But what the crucial difference is that these are, and all the data show this, on average, the, the salaries that multinationals pay in developing countries are quite a bit higher than the average in those countries, which is what counts. So inevitably, of course, you have people looking for jobs in these companies because they pay better, the conditions are generally better, and usually there's a, there's a path of upward mobility, like training programs, and maybe even getting to go and work for these companies abroad and earning even better and sending money back to their families. So there's a higher base compared with the domestic base, and if you like a ladder of upskilling, mobility and life chances with it. Now, I'm not saying that's true of every multinational in every country around the world. Of course, there are plenty of examples of abuses. Those abuses tend to be more in countries that are resource enclaves where multinationals go for natural resources, where you have corrupt governments, you have corrupt deals between the government and the multinational and the local workers get abused. Example copper mining in the Congo. Right? But you have relatively few of those examples with at least world-class multinationals in China and India and elsewhere. 
So, it, and all the evidence shows that that kind of investment, whether it's be to serve the domestic market, particularly if it's a large one like India or Indonesia or China, but even more so if it's a kind of export platform where you're making, say, something that fits into a global supply chain that will end up mainly in Western markets, it's very much part of that East Asian miracle I talked about earlier. So you start, like Singapore did, making transistor radios or even uh, matches from, in matchboxes, of course at dirt low wages in the 1960s. But you go up that ladder actually quite quickly to the point where manufacturing in Singapore today is about making Rolls-Royce engines. Right? Um, it's about all kinds of very advanced stuff where you're paying workers who are skilled, who are qualified, and with a big percentage of university graduates or polytechnic graduates, um, top dollar as it were. And these are people who are in the middle or upper middle class. So it's that ladder of development. And for Sri Lanka, to me, getting on that ladder means attracting that kind of multinational investment uh, in bits and pieces of manufacturing, but mainly in services, uh, in IT-related areas, for example, uh, in ports and log the log logistics. How, you know, how servicing a port involves lots of different complex ancillary services. Um, so that's the promise. That's the potential. To do that, of course, requires difficult reforms and getting the politics right, which is the most difficult part. Yeah. So that's how I would approach your, your question. Yes? Uh, the Buddhism uh, religion known as uh, the spiritual um, and uh, maybe even uncompetitive religion. Yeah. So do you think it, it harms the, the local economy? It's a very good cultural question. Um, I mean, it's a question close to my heart uh, because the nearest thing I have to a religion is Buddhism. Um, I mean, I'm not a card-carrying Buddhist, but uh, um, it's partly that Sri Lankan influence. Having grown up in a majority Buddhist culture, you know, Buddhism is very important to me. Um, I think it's um, the way Buddhism is practiced in Sri Lanka is, yes, I think, very much an obstacle to uh, those animal spirits of entrepreneurship um, and of a functioning market economy. Uh, but the way Buddhism in pract is practiced in Sri Lanka has little to do with <laughs> the Buddhism of the Buddha. It's very ritualized. Uh, it's thoroughly compromised by involvement in politics and with uh, corrupt businessmen. Um, it's very hierarchical. It's all about the, the laity actually pandering monks. Uh, most of those monks do not live very austere lives. Maybe about 5% of them know how to meditate. Um, so it's a caricature of Buddhism, which has corrupted the country in so many ways and is culturally very implanted because it's 2,300 years old. Now, I could criticize other religions in Sri Lanka and indeed elsewhere along similar grounds. But we're going into a, a different territory and perhaps a different lecture. But is Buddhism in its essence inimical to productive economic activity? I can't give you a clear-cut answer on that. Um, it's, I, mean, I would probably maybe give you a simpler answer if I were talking about Judaism or certain types of Christianity particularly of the evangelical variety. Um, you know, why are there so many productive Mormons around in the world, in, in the business world? Why are there so many productive Jews around? You know, there are cultural explanations about that which I think are persuasive. You don't find that many really successful Buddhist entrepreneurs around in the world. Um, you do among some Hindus. Uh, but that takes us into... Into, into different territory, and I haven't resolved that, the answer to that question in my own mind, so I can't give you a confident answer yeah. to, 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 your, uh, to your question. But bear one thing in mind, Buddhism in its origins is a religion of towns. 
Um, so Bud when Buddhism arose in India 2,500 years ago, it was a reaction to very conservative hierarchical Hinduism in the villages and the countryside. It was townspeople, including merchants, who were attracted to Buddhism. Right. So, yeah. Um, yes. Um, you mentioned that very recently there was a rise in the government spending in Sri Lanka. Yeah. So this obviously led to crowding out of yeah. um, private sector investment. Yeah. I wonder um, how do you see the future of private sector in Sri Lanka, uh, particularly given that the central bank is not that much independent? Yeah. Um, so I mean, if, if I were looking at a menu of reforms that needs to be done, first and foremost, the macroeconomy needs to be stabilized. We need to get inflation under control. We need to have serious debt restructuring. So that requires a deal with the uh, International Monetary Fund. Pretty complex negotiations with uh, the Indians, the Chinese, and the Japanese, because we owe a lot of money to their governments. So we need to get them to agree to debt haircuts. Complex negotiations with a whole array of bondholders who hold about, uh, it's about $12 billion of Sri Lanka's 35 plus billion dollars of foreign debt. They're mainly based in the US, so these are the black rocks of this world. That's going to be very complicated. Um, so you need to get all of that done. The government needs to finally get a hold of its finances. Uh, so you need a more rational tax system. Not that many Sri Lankans pay taxes. Taxes are less than 10% of, uh, of GDP. Uh, you have huge spending entitlements, so there's been a, historically a big mismatch between spending and revenue, hence the borrowing. Um, the public sector employs anywhere between 1.6 and 2 million people in Sri Lanka out of a workforce of 8 million. So that's a quarter of the workforce work for the government in one way or other. Right? Uh, the public sector workforce was doubled from about 800,000 to 1.6 million during the period of the Rajapaksas in the space of about 10 to 15 years. So what that means are lots of people who are effectively doing non-jobs uh, and putting obstacles in the way to the private sector while getting salaries and pensions. And it's salaries and pensions that account for a bulk of government spending that isn't accounted for by interest payments on foreign borrowing. Right. Um, that includes paying an army that hasn't downsized since the end of the Civil War. We have 200,000 people in the army. We have 100,000 people in the police force. Uh, so everywhere where you go in Sri Lanka, you see lots of people, particularly in the, in the public sector, just idling, doing nothing. Uh, but they're on the payroll. So all of these things need to happen. Um, in addition to simplifying licenses, uh, having one-stop shops for foreign investment, taking down the trade tariffs, uh, to attract both domestic productive private sector investment as well as foreign investment, as well as productive trade. Uh, so it's a very big agenda. You can't do it all at once. You know, it's got to be planned. It's got to be sequenced. But you've got to start somewhere, and to start somewhere, you've got to get the politics right. And that's what's fundamentally wrong with, 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 with Sri Lanka. So, yes. How would, uh, Are Sri Lankans happy? No. <laughs> this gentleman asked me a very relevant question yesterday. This was after my talk. Are Singaporeans happy? I will, I didn't give, I'll give you an answer to that later. What's your question? <laughs> How would a partisan of the um, ruling family, like the ruling family's party, how does he see the world or yeah. uh, justify the, yeah. the steps that are being taken? Yeah, that, that's, I, that's a good question. So, um, the Rajapaksa family um, are indicative of the ruling class or caste of Sri Lankan politicians today. Our first generation of politicians were, there's an old saying, that the white man from Oxford handed power over to the brown man from Cambridge. That's how independence happened in India and also in Sri Lanka. So it was very much a privileged elite, many of them aristocrats, who had done well under the British, some of whom had been to Oxford and Cambridge, uh, who spoke English as their mother tongue and Singhalese only to their servants. 
who acquired power. Uh, and that had pro problems in itself. But three or four decades later, you have a Rajapaksa type who has power. So this is basically someone, a big man. Sri Lankan politics is all about big men who you know, have their thugs, who have their vote banks, who have their networks of patronage, who get jobs for uh, people who are dependent on them, starting with members of their family. They come from the Sinhalese heartland. Sinhalese is their mother tongue. English they speak as a second language, often not very well. They're less educated. Um, they're more thuggish. They're more corrupt. Uh, they see the world through a much more parochial lens. So they're not very connected with the world. I mean, of course, they go on shopping trips to Dubai and Singapore and, 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 and elsewhere. Uh, they, mon they launder their money abroad. Um, so um, I mean, this is off the record, but uh, um, Sultan, if you ever visit the Marriott in Dubai, the Marriott in Dubai is owned by the Rajapaksa family. I mean, through proxies. Yeah. So there is actually an informal trail you can do in Dubai where you can visit properties owned by the Rajapaksa family. Yeah. So, um, uh, <laughs> so you know, you, you have that kind of thing going on. Um, they play the race card and the ethnic part to divide and rule locally. Um, they understand doing deals and fixing problems by, okay, you have a problem, come to me, I'll fix it by, because I'll call someone. They don't understand rules. That's not in their mindset. Rules apply, applying to everybody is not something they understand. But you have a problem, you come to me, maybe you do me a favor, and I'll get what you want done, whether it's a project or something, something else. So it's that kind of mentality which translates into politics. Yeah. I just, I just have a question about when we were looking at the data. I mean, it seems like Sri Lanka isn't the first country to fall in this trap. Yeah. So like, why has anyone like, prevented all this before it happened? Well, I mean, it's been, it's been tried in Sri Lanka on several occasions. Um, I'll come to a bit of, I'm coming to a bit of historical context. So uh, let me answer your question by just going through those, those bullet points. Yeah. Um, okay. So th that's a very nice segue to explanations of the crisis. Now, this crisis didn't happen by accident. It was man or person made. How did it happen? And what are the lessons for the rest of the world is what I want to get get through. But to start on that road of explanation, uh, let me give you some post-independence context. Um, and that's a roundabout way of answering your, your, your question. So, uh, I mean, I would divide Sri Lanka's economic record into these three phases. At independence itself, and this is how far countries can fall, Around 1950, Ceylon, as it was then called, so Ceylon is the old name for Sri Lanka, that was the British name for it, was the second wealthiest country in Asia after Japan. So in terms of living standards, the second wealthiest country in Asia. Right? Um, far wealthier than South Korea, for example, uh, or Taiwan. Um, why? because of its plantation crops, exports of tea, rubber, and coconut in particular. 1956 was the crucial turning point because a new government, instead of deciding to go down the East Asian miracle route, which I talked about yesterday, decided to go down the Indian route uh, because India at the time was very much in the throes, in thrall to Fabian socialism. So the government, the new prime minister who came to power in 1956, first he played a language card saying Sinhalese was going to be the only official language at the expense of English and Tamil. Right. So he incited a lot of ethnic problems as a result. He nationalized bus companies and other things. He increased trade protection. He gave priority to domestic companies at the expense of foreign companies investing in Sri Lanka. So foreign investment became more difficult. There were price controls on things like rice and other staple products. And all of that, that package only became bigger and bigger. The public sector became bigger. And it became extreme in the 1970s, up until 1977. 
And I experienced this as a child where Sri Lanka was like Mrs. Gandhi's India. You needed a license for everything. Very little could be imported. I remember as children, we used to salivate at the prospect of a relative coming from abroad with a bar of Cadbury's chocolate or a tin of instant Nescafe coffee. Because those were real luxury products in Sri Lanka at the time. There was bread rationing. There were queues for everything. There were rice shortages. There was one year when we didn't actually have sugar for tea or coffee. Uh, we had to use something called juggery instead. Um, so all of that happened. The economy crashed by 1975-1976. There was an election, a new government, a new government which liberalized. So Sri Lanka was the first to liberalize in South Asia, before India, almost 15 years before India. There was a big liberalization program in the late 70s and early 80s. A lot of the right things were done. The garments industry took off. So Sri Lanka's leading export sector now is not tea, it's garments. And the garment sector took off with, uh, now with some innovative companies. So Sri Lanka's best companies today are the three biggest garments companies, which are actually run by very productive minorities. It's an interesting cultural coda to this. Uh, but that's a result very much of liberalization. But during that period, 1977 to 2005, it was stop-go. Sometimes on, sometimes off. The government didn't stop spending, so there were balance of payments problems, there were fiscal deficit problems, the currency kept depreciating, there was inflation. And then come 2005, another election, the Rajapaksa family came to power, there was a civil war going on, they won the civil war and got political ballast as a result of it. They ruled the country for 10 years, out of power for five years and then back again in 2020. But during this last phase, effectively Sri Lanka has had de-liberalization. So the government policies have been to increase tariffs on imports, to make life more complicated for foreign investors unless they happen to be backed by the Chinese state. Uh, many, many more price controls domestically. Uh, lots of ad hoc chopping and changing of regulations, vastly increasing the size of the public sector, including a national airline, the electricity board, the Ceylon Petroleum Corporation. I talked about that earlier. So effective deliberalization, which paved the way to the crisis that Sri Lanka has uh, today. And I mean, a few other charts. You look at this chart. Sri Lanka has consistently run budget deficits almost since independence. Right. Um, Lee Kuan Yew of Singapore once said that Sri Lankan budgets are an auction of non-existent resources. Very true. That, of course, means more and more borrowing. And the root of Sri Lanka's problems is very much the fiscal sector. Government having a low tax take, not so much because of low taxes, but because the tax system is corrupt and inefficient, but spending more and more and more and more entitlements which are difficult or impossible to reverse, more foreign borrowing, crowding out productive government spending on things that are necessary, like healthcare and education, and so on. Debt now at over 100% of GDP, uh, declining exports, uh, stagnant foreign investment, and so on. So you have all of that contributing over time to this crisis, and then we come to some very basic and really stupefying policy blunders in the last two and a half years. So after Gotambaya Rajapaksa became president, one of his first um, measures was to increase the public sector by 100,000. That, that was his campaign pledge. He created an extra 100,000 100, public sector jobs. That, of course, meant increasing long-term public spending on salaries and pensions. His first budget cut taxes radically. That benefited the rich. But, of course, it destroyed the finances because the tax take was already lo low, and it meant the budget deficit and borrowing had to increase. The central bank printed money like there was no tomorrow, meaning more inflation. Um, and just to give you, and by the way, the central bank printed money in the name of modern monetary theory. 
uh, which has become quite fashionable recently. So this is the danger of ideas often propagated by economists with double PhDs and in high level policy positions going to a developing country where then in a very half-baked way they're used as a kind of intellectual justification for really very damaging policies which end up affecting poor people worst of all. I mean just think of a poor person having to pay three times the price for an egg compared to what it was in January. Right? So that's the translation effect. And to cap it all, in the midst of COVID, the president, who was advised by some of his advisors that Sri Lanka should become the first organic nation on earth. Right? So again, organic. Now, I'm not against organic farming. I consume organic farming products. But I am against a government overnight banning imports of chemical fertilizer in the name of making the country the first organic farming nation on earth, as if the whole of Sri Lanka could become a giant Whole Foods, <laughs> which of course most people can't afford. What happened? Quite predictably, within no time, the tea harvest declined by one third because there was no fertilizer for the tea bushes. Paddy farmers, so we're talking about poor farmers with small plots of land, didn't have fertilizer for their paddy crop. So they, were, they didn't have income for, for food. And so on. And that's still playing out today because now there's a shortage of foreign exchange to pay for the import of fertilizer. So you have all of this happening, but as a double whammy, of course, all of this happening at the same time as a COVID crisis, meaning no tourists and business travelers. Right? And then, of course, the Russia-Ukraine war, meaning skyrocketing fuel prices in particular. So these external changes, these external uh, negative changes, at the same time, of course, it became impossible for Sri Lanka to borrow abroad uh, because interest rates started going up. Some explanations about how this crisis uh, happened. Uh, any... any any further questions or thoughts on what I've gone through so far? Yes, go ahead. It's quite a personal question. But yeah. Being able to foresee that, and as a Sri Lanka uh, citizen or someone who was born and brought up there, seeing the effect of individuals on the one end that are in position of power, yeah. and on the other end, the lack of ability to influence of other individuals who, who foresee that, what do you think is the remedy for the individual living in the country yeah. to try to manage it? Uh, it's, a, it's a conundrum. Uh, it's a dilemma. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, sure. Um, so, um, why, why, why don't you repeat your question? Just speak a little yeah. bit louder, please. Um, it seems that on the one hand, uh, individuals in the position of power in developing countries or even in developed countries where they uh, can uh, lead economic uh, policies that lead to major uh, negative consequences. And on the other hand, uh, individuals that aren't in the position to influence these policies uh, are there to foresee that but not being able to influence that. So yeah. as the individuals that uh, doesn't have doesn't have power in that scenarios. What is the remedy for that individual it, in the sense to impact yeah. in some sense? What is going on and also in his personal life? Uh, how to manage okay. that? So uh, let, uh, let, let I mean it, it's it's a very valid question um, Let me give you a sense of how individuals in That position are reacting and they are reacting in different ways um, Particularly on this last trip, um, in addition to seeing lots more beggars on the street, more than I've seen since the 1970s, a lot of people kept coming up to me, because you know, I look more white than brown, you know, can, can you get me a job in Singapore, in Dubai, in the UK, in the US or elsewhere? Uh, a lot of people are looking to leave. Poor people to do blue collar manual jobs, uh, which is of long standing but also increasing numbers of professionals. 
Now, Sri Lanka has had a professional brain drain since the 1950s. That's also not new. And because of the policies I've talked about. But it's accelerating now in this crisis. It's one of the saddest things to observe during this crisis because of its severity, that you have more and more uh, professionals, you know, including graduates, unless they come from really rich families, because then they've got their own businesses and you know, that's okay. Um, but otherwise, aspiring people who see no hope in Sri Lanka are of course looking to go to the UK, to Australia, to Canada, particularly to Australia and Canada because they have more liberal immigration policies, which favor those with qualifications and with relevant work experience. So these are people who will get green cards or the equivalent in places like Australia and Canada, where there are already significant Sri Lankan communities, so they can link on to relatives and others who are already there. So that's happening. In other words, an accelerated brain drain. That's one very obvious and rational way of responding to, 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 to what's happening. Um, for those who are committed to staying, for whatever reason, it could, be elder, it could be elderly relatives, it could be because they really want to do something to turn Sri Lanka around and to try and bring about a better Sri Lanka for themselves and others. Um, I think very few say, no, I want to go into politics to make a difference because the perception, and it's a valid perception, is that this political system is monopolized by insiders who've been there for decades, who come from political dynasties, who ensure that it's their sons and daughters, and mainly their sons, who carry their mantle, who monopolize those patronage networks, uh, who've still got a stranglehold on the system. All the parties are compromised, so what's the point? I'm just going to bang my head against a brick wall. The whole system is rigged against me. So very few of those decent types uh, try and make it in politics. You find, I mean, I, I come across the, the, thin, the think tank I helped to set up, it's called Advocata, has some of these young, aspiring 20, 30-something professionals, uh, some of whom are committed to staying in Sri Lanka. One of whom, and I have great hopes for him, who's the CEO of this think tank, comes from the other side of the tracks. So he doesn't come from a privileged background. Uh, he's actually made it into the Colombo elite, even though Singhala is his mother tongue. He comes from a poor family. Until five years ago, I first met him five or six years ago, his English was broken. Now it's very good. Right. Um, I would like to see people like him break into the political system. But that requires probably some kind of change in the constitution and in the electoral system. So you rely less on money politics to get elected in the first place. Right. The problem is to get elected in the first place, you need to do all kinds of favors to compromise business people. So you have a problem in the political system. And without that institutional change, you're probably not going to get serious economic change or policy change. So institutions here are really, really crucial. Or what, what can you do? Like. Um, some really good friends of mine, including the couple who run the charity I work with, they're, they're, they're not trying to change politics. They're, they're not political. They try and ameliorate or improve the lives of, let's say, the bottom 20, 30 percent of Sri Lankans by doing things directly. And that's humanitarian charity work. I know of maybe a minority of business people who run very successful businesses, but at the same time um, are sort of genuine stakeholder capitalists, not the type of stakeholder capitalism that Josh talked about earlier, but who do their own thing um, and uh, whose businesses themselves provide uh, much better livelihoods and life chances for ordinary Sri, Sri Lankans than, than other businesses. They tend to be the businesses that are connected to the outside world through trade and investment, more so than the domestic businesses that tend to rely more on political connections to get deals done and keep the competition out. So, so that's, if you like, a range of responses. Um, but unfortunately, what we're not seeing, probably won't see, is 
individuals making a difference to the political system, making a difference to the institutions, that would then lead to the right long-term policies that would turn the country around. Yes? Um, you mentioned the um, monetary um, solutions that came from outside of Sri Lanka, inside, uh, by proclaimed experts, uh, and they turned out to be uh, more damaging than doing good. Yeah. And I wanted to ask if you can elaborate on these steps, what exactly happened, what went wrong about them, what, yeah. did, what was not getting. Um, well, several things. Um, firstly, the exchange rate. Um, every country needs a realistic, in other words, market-based uh, exchange rate uh, for transactions, both for short-term trade, capital movements, and so on. Right. The problem with Sri Lanka and many other countries besides is that policymakers, senior decision makers, get addicted to artificial exchange rates. In Sri Lanka's case, they tend to be overvalued. Right? Uh, and then the central bank, usually with government backing, spends a lot of foreign reserves to defend that exchange rate against speculators, both domestic and foreign. But there comes a time when you run out of reserves, or almost, um, and you just have to let the exchange rate float. And when it floats, it just drops, as it has happened in Sri Lanka in March. And you have huge disruption. Um, far better to actually have a managed pathway to a floating exchange rate uh, determined by the market. But you know, do it in a sequence of steps so you don't have something disorderly and chaotic happening. Or in the case of some countries that have a chronic record of not being able to manage their exchange rate well, to just fix it to an exchange rate, a, a, a currency that has confidence in the world, like the US dollar. So th th that's the rationale for something called a currency board, which Hong Kong has, which Argentina has. There's a little debate in Sri Lanka about whether we should have a currency board, dollar backed perhaps, which would provide that external discipline. Um, so that's, there's an exchange rate issue. There's a money printing issue. You know, the government tells the central bank, you know, you need to print more money uh, so we can have more money to spend on public sector salaries and pensions, for example. And the central bank does it because it's under the behest of the government. Um, and then you have inflation going up. Uh, you have a borrowing problem. Uh, you have a confidence problem. Uh, you have an interest rate problem because interest rates are not aligned properly with the real economy. Then you have a central bank that's also in charge of regulating financial markets. So it's in Sri Lanka, as in many countries, you have the central bank doing both central banking operations and financial market regulation. In Sri Lanka, that's been a recipe for often dodgy central bank governors appointed for political reasons to rig markets in favor of players they're connected to. So we've had two or three quite dodgy bond auctions. In one auction, the son-in-law of the then governor made a book profit of $800 million. Uh, so you have all of those. So institutions, again, important. It's probably uh, we've been talking about a monetary law in Sri Lanka to ensure legally central bank independence, uh, to have an inflation target, and a few other things, all of which are necessary, but n formal legal independence is not necessarily the same thing as uh, de facto real independence, especially in a small country where the elite is small, where everybody knows everybody else, and where often they're related to each other. <laughs> I mean, I know you have, there, there are echoes of this in Israel, but it's a different scale in Sri Lanka. Yes? I guess that the international community was aware of the crisis. Yeah. Uh, and they supply money to the, uh, to the country. They, was they able like, to do something like advising? Or yeah, well, yeah, yes. Uh, so, um, uh, particularly under the Rajapaksa family, 
India and the West have been less influential because they're not considered friends, especially the West. So let, let me talk about two other, I mean, two other actors. Um, one is the IMF. Sri Lanka has had 16 IMF programs since independence. They're now negotiating the 17th IMF emergency loan program, which is necessary, but it just shows that influence and pressure and expert advice and textbook um, recipes from the IMF, I don't discount them, unlike some libertarians, uh, but that's not going to sort out Sri Lanka's problems from the outside. It has to come from bottom up, from the inside. At best, it can be a kind of complementary support. But it just shows that if the domestic politics and institutions are wrong, the IMF is not going to sort out Sri Lanka's problem. Rather, it'll be a case of going back to the IMF again and again and again. The other actor is China. And China has played, I think, it, in my view, on balance, a negative role in Sri Lanka. So I, we talked about China in Africa yesterday. So a similar story in some respects. Uh, not as extreme a problem because only about 10% of Sri Lanka's foreign debt is owed to China. Uh, so it's not like Pakistan or Zambia or Venezuela. But the Chinese have been lending to Sri Lanka, which has only increased the incentive for the Sri Lankan government to borrow from other places to fund infrastructure projects. Some of these infrastructure projects have involved a lot of corruption and have been vanity projects. They haven't served any you know, halfway obvious commercial purpose. I talked about the airport and the convention center in, in the port of Hambantota. Um, and finally, the Chinese, the loans are secretive. We don't know clearly what those, their conditions are. Um, at least if you, if you think of World Bank or ADB or IMF loans, there is much more transparency. And the Chinese have contributed to this crisis because they were telling the Sri Lankan government, no, no, don't go to the IMF. Experts were telling the Sri Lankan government, go to the IMF two and a half years ago. But the Chinese told, no, don't go to the IMF. We'll provide you loans so you can roll over the existing debt. In other words, kicking the can down the road until the inevitable crisis. So the Chinese have had a negative part to play in all of this. We saw like where Sri Lanka is located, so it's a very strategic position yeah. for maritime uh, yeah. transit. I mean, they've thought uh, about, the, uh, about making a port, I think the Hambantota port, but like that was built with the Chinese. So like what happened exactly there, and what is like the view of a Sri Lankan on this matter? Okay, so um, the Chinese built that port, plus the airport close by, plus the convention center, plus the cricket stadium. Um, the total cost of all these items, we're talking of several hundred million dollars at market rates of interest, right, built by Chinese companies, importing Chinese labor. But then under the last government, when, when I was involved in, in policy advice, so I, mean, I saw this up close quite reasonably, I knew the minister in charge reasonably well, um, the government said, sorry, you know, we can't afford to pay the service, the, the, uh, uh, the interest and principal on these loans. So we need to negotiate something with you. And the negotiation resulted in effectively a debt for equity swap. So that debt owed to China for these projects was converted into Chinese equity. In other words, Chinese equity in particularly the port to be run by a Chinese operator with majority Chinese ownership on a, I think a 99 year lease or something like that. So effectively, so the Chinese now run that port and own that port. Now that has geopolitical implications. Do they own it partly or completely? Not, they own it partly. Okay. And there's a separate arrangement for the security operation because when the government was going to give everything to the Chinese, they got a call from the Indian High Commissioner uh, who was clearly called by his Prime Minister and said, sorry, you can't do that because you're handing the security operation of the port to the Chinese, which means a nuclear submarine can dock there and the government can't do anything about it. 
So because of Indian pressure and American pressure to some extent, the government did a separate arrangement for the security arrangements, right, where it has the majority at stake and it provides the security. However, the geopolitical translation of this means about a month or two ago, uh, some Chinese, I think some ship of the Chinese Navy was supposed to dock in Hambantota. The Indians objected, I think the Americans objected. The government told the Chinese, would you mind postponing this? The Chinese said, no, we're coming anyway, which is, so the, the ship docked. Um, okay, so uh, we, I know we just have a couple of minutes left. Uh, so let, let me just uh, conclude with, um, I think it's my final slide, global lessons from the Sri Lankan crisis. So just three or four quick points. Sri Lanka, not just now, but over decades, has had this pretty toxic combination of political, collect political populism and economic collectivism. And collectivist ideas are powerful in Sri Lanka. They endure. I come across people all the time, including friends of mine, including perfectly decent people, who believe self-sufficiency is a good thing. It's pure, it's simple, it's austere. But who don't realize that translates into a crony capitalist monopolizing the market, say, for babies' nappies or tires or concrete, jacketing up the price, which, of course, affects the poor most of all. And that person has political connections to keep the competition out. That's, how, that's what it means. So you have, and Sri Lanka isn't the only country in this situation, that combination of political populism and economic collectivism. That leads to degraded institutions, diminished state capacity, lower productivity and economic decline. When you have a government who does, which does a lot of things badly, inevitably that has economic repercussions for the productive parts of the economy. Rather than having a government that, that does maybe a fewer number of things well, which is what I mean by good state capacity. Right. Third point, unpredictable changes in the outside world, like a COVID crisis, like a war in the Ukraine, can trigger full-blown crises domestically, which are effectively homegrown because of the kinds of domestic mistakes that Sri Lanka and others have made. And very finally, over-dependence on China. Sri Lanka, again, isn't, in the only, uh, isn't the only country in this situation here in South Asia or uh, other parts of Asia. The Maldives is in a similar condition of dependence. Pakistan, if not worse. Um, the right kind of geopolitics and international relations and foreign policy for Sri Lanka, in my view, is certainly to be friends with China, not to be enemies with China, but to strengthen our friendships, political, geopolitical, and commercial, with our near neighbor, India, with the West, uh, also with a view to attracting private sector investment for global supply chains, uh, and all that, and geopolitical balance. Um, and ultimately, something perhaps more cultural. Uh, Sri Lanka's external friends should be its civilizational friends, and preferably countries that are open societies with market economies and liberal democracies. Uh, India doesn't fit that perfectly, by the way. Uh, but uh, that, rather than having China as first friend, uh, I think we're right up at midday, so we will have to stop. Thank you for your attention, for your questions.